Yeah, there's something. And, and right now we have time to talk about wild greens and dinner projects before the movie starts. So talking about how we make our squash for dinner seems appropriate. <laughs> if we want to take a minute for that. We may, and we yeah, thank you, Pearl. Um, one thing with, uh, with the effective mycorrhiza and mulching is that it's really great and it helps our plants, but whatever soil is in the, the, our water table and the plant's ability to transpire and respire is totally real. What plants do is they suck moisture out of the soil. Even if you cover that top layer of soil, what plants do is they go into the soil and they suck the water out and they release it through their leaves. That's why we love them because they create oxygen and all these wonderful things. And they're gonna do that. You can mulch, you can cardboard, you can put black plastic, you can do whatever you want to. Um, I mean, don't do anything toxic, but that plant is gonna be sucking water out of the ground and putting it in the air. And, and there's nothing we can do. We, we don't wanna stop that process. That's how they grow. Yeah. So uh, it's really important to be aware of your soil type. Is it clay? Clay retains moisture more. Is it um, sand that won't hold any moisture? Do you live in the Northwest where there is a modified Mediterranean climate? A Mediterranean climate does not rain in the summer. That's what we have. <laughs> That's what the Northwest is. So we can't really get away with not watering things unless per Steve Solomon, he has great spacing tables in his Growing Vegetables West of the Cascades book and his other book, Gardening When It Counts. He suggests if you don't want to irrigate in the Pacific Northwest, plant your squash like 10 feet apart with mm -hmm. no competition and keep it weeded. And then it's the only thing drawing from that bank of soil. And it's likely that you can get away with this term called fertigation, where once a month you can bring a five gallon bucket full of fertilizer water because you put dead fish in it or comfrey with a little tiny hole in the bottom and you can set that near your squash maybe once a month and it will get water re, uh, restocked into the soil around your plant so that it has the ability to release it and grow. Right. Um, it, what is interesting that I observed um, on the squash terrace experiment of 2020 at Sahali was um, that the one that made it was huge and it was right next to, you got mentioning in the chat, the comfrey. There's this um, oh. little corner that's full of comfort. And then on the other end, there's this little tiny squash. And if I hadn't irrigated, it would be dead before the rains mm -hmm. came by. So um, there's something going on with that comfrey, isn't there? <laughs> I'll share some experiences with squash, if, if you all want to hear. Sure, um, please do. We've had a, amazing success over quite a number of years. Um, just making squash mounds and uh, granted every context is different you know there's high and dry um, Mediterranean climates there's moisture areas um, but it's it's good to remember uh, that squash are, are um, originally they're arid plants so all squash cucumbers um, melons all those if you look at them closely they're all covered in hair little lots of little spines lots of little um undulations in their leaves and they actually thrive with as little water as possible they pull they i, I hear what you're saying shaley uh, they take water out of the ground but they also harvest water out of the air and so if you have a good swing of temperature between night and day they will they will self-water themselves. And if you look at a squash leaf, each leaf is like a funnel and it captures that dew that it gathers at night and it funnels it right down. And at the base of that stem of that leaf, there's a little root and that's where the fruit is. And so each of these are water harvesting uh, devices to, to harvest dew out of the temperature swings within your climate. Um, so we don't actually water any of our squash. We do one wheelbarrow full of bedding hay and manure, and we just do a dump, and we do a dump, and we do a dump, and they're maybe you know six feet apart, and we plant squash seeds in there. And we've had bumper um, crops of delicata, uh, kombucha, um, naked seed pumpkins, zucchinis, you name it. Um, but we're a little bit moister. We're not as high and dry kind of area. And we do have cool evenings 
and, um, and warm days um, during the summer growing months. But, um, you know, definitely squash do not like their leaves getting wet. And so if you do water it, like that bucket method and stuff is really good um, to do a fertigation, um, a deep watering very infrequently. Um, but I've found that like we have dairy cows, so dairy manure and dairy um, bedding hay, it holds moisture for quite a long time. <laughs> And so you put that down fresh and you plant seeds in it in the spring and it's still moist come fall, you know, it's amazing. But I give credit to the squash for being able to harvest dew and the swings of temperature as well. I think it goes back to that principle of, or not principle or just the truth that you need to know your soil. Like here where I live, it's sand and rocks. So there's very little carrying capacity yeah. and there's very little rain in Squim too. So in the summer, we don't really have that big of fluctuations or that much moisture. So like our, our squash was withering in the summer and, and needed some water. And so you don't know in, in your space there, Julie, it is on a terrace. So there's some drain happening, but you're not sure, you know, yeah. unless you know where the water's flowing and how much sand and clay and other things are going on there, it could be going downhill. And so- If, if it, the it water's going right down point. that, what I described. Yeah. <laughs> it's going down that stream, but it's right next outside of my garden. So David or somebody, I would love to get some of that water into the terraces that is going right down into the stream. Let's, let's go yeah, take a look at it. Yeah. yeah, and then I see a question here about spacing from silt from Sylvan, and I don't understand what it says. And we also have like that. Just What's the question? Uh, so um, the guy who you were talking about said put them 10 feet apart yeah. and nothing else in between them and no competition for that water. Wouldn't mm -hmm. you just be trading weeding for watering? Like you no but, longer have to water them, but if you have to keep, I mean, that's a lot of bare space. Nature abhors a vacuum. Oh, for sure, for sure, that, that there, there is. If there's bare space, something's gonna try to grow there. And in that sort of, it's, it's somewhat intensive, but I, it's actually my preferred way to grow lettuce because I don't like to water my lettuce and it helps uh, keep it juicy, is, is to use a, a hoe, like a hula hoe or a, just a sharp hula hoe. And yeah. if, you, if you, I can weed like a half an acre in 15 minutes a month if I know what plants I'm trying to maintain. So it's not really that intensive. And with this constant scraping just on the half top inch, this isn't like normal permaculture talk, but this is me as a gardener <laughs> telling you my, my favorite way to grow food is that uh, I can keep what, what is called a dust mulch, where you have this light layer of disturbed soil that isn't quite as easy for weeds to come in. And if they come in, I just, I just destroy them all running through with my sharp hoe. I like sharpen it with a rasp. So it's, it's a pretty effective tool to knock all the weeds down. And then what I want can just get taller and it's really easy to see it. I totally love polycultures and places where there's this layering of ground cover and shrubs and flowers. Mm -hmm. And I tried to record a video of my front herb useful garden. That's like that, that I'll, I'll share if I can at some point over the weekend, but for, for really just rock and vegetables in a patch of land, it can be nice just to have a space that's totally cleared that is kept clean with a hoe. Uh, yeah, Julie? Well, what's interesting is that <clears throat> while we do drain a lot um, on the terrace, it seems like water just disappears. Um, <clears throat> and and Cheryl and Anthony did tell me that with the um, effective microorganisms on the mowed grass and the cardboard, um, I shouldn't, you know, I really shouldn't need much irrigation. What's interesting is that what's, what Shaley said is true. The little, the big one next, the big squash plant next to the comfrey is about 10 feet away from the little one all by itself. And the other thing that's interesting is that um, I am successfully um, combating the weeds because I put down cardboard and, and, um, and grass. And so the bind weed, which is so hard to get rid of the morning glory is like I think I mean I have to keep observing but there's these little tiny spindly things that come out so after like months I can just pull all that out very easily 
and I'm going to have great soil next year for for that square uh, squash terrace. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, the cardboard and mulch <laughs> is a really nice way to manage that too. Yeah, we have a few so. questions um, that have come in. I I can. Uh, there was a from Sylvan. Yeah, one of them was deer. Uh, have... be before that was uh, Sylvan mentioned rocks. And I would say, yeah, rocks are a really fun thing to make microclimates, stop evaporation. I, I thought of that without getting too technical when it came to the space that we just talked about is pull some rocks out. Use some of the rocks to kind of create some shade and things like that. There's a lot of fun things to do with rocks, but we don't go too deeply in that. But yes, rocks are awesome. Uh, solutions. Anybody have a solution for deer? I have my deer solution. I'd love to hear other people's deer solution. Yeah. What's yours, Shaylee? I know you've got, you have to have a deer solution. Is this I do have a deer solution. One of them that is kind of gory and the ethical person in me uh, is a little bit chagrined by it, but it's also a waste product that's produced anyways. And that is to use blood meal, which is a common nitrogen fertilizer, organic fertilizer. It's taken from a byproduct from the just commercial meat industry is the blood and dried blood is an incredible deer deterrent because mm. um, it does not smell like anything they want to eat. Uh, you need to be aware that you're putting a bunch of nitrogen in your soil, but it repels the deer at there's a five acre kind of ornamental permaculture landscape that I've been taking care of for about 18 years on a weekly basis now. And that's how we keep the deer away from the blueberries that are all over the place. Mm. And it works. Anybody else have any deer? Because uh, this is a fun topic. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of recipes involving beer and eggs and chilies too that you can look up on the internet. Kathy, Kathy Ging, are you're unmuted. Uh, was that to make a comment about this or no? Oh, okay. Well, cougar shit was uh, well known among the pot growers in Southern Oregon years ago. And I don't know whether you can still get it, but there is a product at the local natural food store regarding uh, cougar uh, elements in it. And one thing, back to the topic of squash, um, about, about the squash, do you know that one of the founders of Oregon Tilth, our, um, Harry McCormick, quotes a lawyer named J.J. Hoppala, who is uh, featured prominently in the book called Transition from Conventional to Organic Agriculture, of course, that's available at sunbowfarms.org. But they found out that the arsenic from the old uh, spraying of the cherry orchard in the River Road area was uh, keeping the arsenic in the ground. So they couldn't grow squash that was going that deep into the ground. There were certain kinds of squash that could not be grown there and still be called organic. And then back to the dry farming, you know, having been selling real estate for 30 years, I've learned from farmers like the Horton Road Organics is one of the most popular farms here. Uh, they had farmers who moved up, moved up here from California that, you know, 30 years ago were growing tomatoes without any water. And so they would put them in earlier enough in, in the spring. And the final thing, or uh, two other things, is um, Rado Rock. Uh, you haven't talked much about rock dust. But Marie Rado, the Rado rock was ruled the gourmet rock dust, the glacial rock dust. But then she was being ripped off by people getting the rock dust from some other place. Uh, but you should say something about that. And then finally, you know, for loosening up your soil, I actually did the gardening notes from a, a gardening teacher at um, San Francisco University who retired after 35 years. And I, I think he said that gypsum can loosen soil, but it's a, a soil amendment rather than just a condition it because I think it can permanently change the pH. Anyway, just thought I'd share those little ditties with you. Yeah. Uh, to jump on rock dust real quick, we need to always ask what the environmental costs are. And sometimes it's pretty extensive and sometimes it's not. Uh, Langingham, who's the multiple PhD awesome person who spoke a keynote speech, I guess two years ago at the Convergence, she's a mentor of mine and her opinion is we can do so much more with a lot less if our microorganisms have the right climate and the right stuff to assimilate the micronutrients to the plants. Even yeah. less water, less nutrients and such like that. So when we're creating the right environment for nature to do itself, we don't need uh, uh, so much of this rock dust and all these other things that are brought in. We can, nature has a way of healing with what's right there. Um, so any other uh, quick deer? Uh, yeah. I have something to chime in. Um, so I, I don't, Hi, thanks for everyone sharing. Um, uh, I've, I don't know if anybody's heard of Sepp Holzer's bone sauce. 
Um, it is a process uh, that, that, that he brought over. It's old school Austrian uh, deer and other herbivore preventative for perennial trees and shrubs. Um, essentially, it's you take uh, fresh bones from a herbivore, oftentimes a cow or a deer itself, and it's cooked in a no oxygen atmosphere, essentially uh, uh, kind of a double boiler of sorts. And if you're really curious about this, you can Google bone sauce and there's some videos on him talking about it and several people making it. Um, and I've made it a number of times and used it with not a hundred percent success rate, but pretty dang good. And so what this is, is you end up with this, you cook it down in a bonfire in a sealed like a uh, Dutch oven thing. And you end up with this sticky gooey tar kind of material. It smells like an old barbecue grill. And that tar then can, that's your concentrate that can get diluted down with um, milk or um, even warm water or a little bit of oil in there to cut, cut the grease out of that. And then it can be sprayed or painted with a brush on the trunk of the tree. And what happens is this gets incorporated into the tree, absorbed into it and exuded out through its leaves and the tips of its, its growing tips. And it can stay systemic within the plant for decades, according to Sepp Holzer. Um, and I mean, I haven't had decades to trial with it, but I have painted it on uh, trees um, here and at clients places with a high degree of success. And it tends to stave off uh, voles and rabbits from girdling trees. It staves mm -hmm. off um, deer from browsing the tips of trees. They will still browse some, but they kind of back away from it after uh, getting a taste. So they, they have very sensitive noses, herbivores, and they can sense this, this, oh, somebody cooked one of my cousins and it's like in this tree and I don't want to eat that. Um, so that's that one technique. Fruit What's that? I, I imagine it might provide like trace calcium or something to the tree. Does it affect oh, fruit or possibly. anything like that? So, so I also do biodynamic farming and there is another um, process called tree paste and that uses cow manure, um, uh, rock dust, other things um, infused in that and that does like oak bark and that does infuse uh, trace elements into the tree, but that is more specifically to strengthen the tree and not so much strengthen against pests and so much, not so much to deter uh, browsers. Mm. The other technique that I've heard that works really well, um, and I've seen it uh, in place in one location, and that is to do a single electric wire around the place you're trying to, to um, protect. Um, right at deer browse height and you put tin foil folded over that electric wire and then you paint peanut butter on that tin foil. And, in the, and especially if you have deer that cross, you have a deer sector that comes through that area, you get those deer to lick that electric tin foil peanut butter plate once or twice and they'll never go near it again. Um, and you don't have to keep it electrified all the time. You just turn it on in the spring when they're like changing their habits and so forth. Yes. <laughs> that totally brings up a question if it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I heard about this just recently from Tanya over in um, Tanya, over in Union, one of my local permies. And <clears throat> I, for my birthday, Russ, put in a garden it was amazing um <clears throat> and we put in electric fence but i forgot to tell him that you know posts that are about as tall as my shoulder are like useless to deer <clears throat> but tanya suggested peanut butter on there and my question you know so that you know they never have to learn that they can jump over um that if we electrify the the fence on these shoulder length posts and then put peanut butter on them, which I didn't know about the tip, the foil that makes sense. Um, strips of foil would hold peanut butter better. Um, but my question is, 
it seems like you'd have to do the peanut butter every season because there's new deer that hasn't learned that yet. Yes, yeah? correct. Okay. <laughs> correct. So this That's is... yearly task. <laughs> peanut butter. You're electric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is something that's not like the the fail safe for sure everything, but deer are fairly habitual in their patterns. Like they, they sleep at the right time, they travel a certain path, they browse certain things. And once you train them up, and usually it's early spring, that like those big silver shiny things in that whole area is like, that's scary over there. So like I said, when it's fawning season, you, you do it, every, the garden's just getting going, you know, you get, they get zapped once or twice, and pretty much like that's not on their path anymore. They're going around the other way. Thank you, Brian. This is super yeah. awesome. Um, and you lead me into my version, which you were talking about black locusts. So you're, you had some black locusts. Black locusts were a foundation tree and turning clay Oklahoma uh, dust bowl um, sloped land that lost all of its topsoil into fertile food forests and yeah. using swales on contour. But I basically, I could get a black locust tree super cheap and they grew super well. And so what I did was I just planted my, my fruit trees within there. And then we turned around and you can cut the branches off of the black locust and put them kind of, I don't really know, like a three access um, system. So they'd, I'd stack all of the branches around, maybe about six foot distance from the fruit tree. And once those black locust branches start to stack and they got thorns on them and such, it just creates an environment that they don't like. And 99% exactly. of the time, I mean, I just didn't have any problem. As long as I can get black locust plants, and keep in mind, there's no energy there. There's no buying of anything. Um, we're already going to chop and drop. And uh, the black locust trees, I think, cost me about 10 cents a piece when I was buying them by the thousand. So, um, yeah. there, there are a number of, of plants that you can put into your system that will do that. You know, um, uh, gooseberry, um, uh, sea buckthorn, mm. ro uh, Rosa rugosa. I mean, all of these kind of thorny pioneer species plants. Oh, I used the pioneer word. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh, um, <laughs> all, all, all these defensive <laughs> species <laughs> have these thorns. Um, they're gonna they're gonna keep deer away. And then if you're talking fruit trees, another thing I would add is don't prune off the lower branches. Let uh, the deer browse the lower branches. Right you know, yes. get something, and then yeah. and then you have more branches. Like if you lose some, big whoop, you got other branches. You know, if you prune this tree to like the perfect tree shape, whatever that is, um, and the deer take some of that away, well, then you're, you, you don't have, you know, all these other options. Not enough. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was the first thing is we need to plant some for the deer. The deer are a great part of that forest and, and of the food forest. Um, oh, I don't know who it was I once said, you know, I plant, you know, this amount of the tree for the deer and then this amount of tree is for me and you know the humans and, and then, then the top is for the birds <laughs> is for the birds yeah and so let's just plant abundance and keep in mind if we're going to have this system that's super resilient you're going to have trees whose leaves are going to be not, um so minerally rich that the deer are going to be like no i'm not going to go to this monocrop farm over here i'm coming over to the permaculture farm to eat because that's the good stuff and yeah. deer have a sense of what's best for them so the trees they're eating are going to be a sign that it's probably doing pretty good and then that tree's going to be able to kind of rebuild that growth now if a tree is being attacked by bugs that might be a sign that the tree is not in a good health um but yeah deer deer have the same opinion as can well. i ask hey I'm, can i ask um so holly actually has these things i don't know if it's black lotus but they're um they're almost invasive and they have all these stickers on them and <clears throat> So we could use that around the fruit trees at Sahale, the nut trees, or the trees we're trying to start, the food forest. Um, <clears throat> but are you yes, saying, yes. David, that you would take the twigs, um, the non the dead trimmed twigs, and make a structure around it? Or are you saying, like, you yes, wouldn't want yes. it to grow it around it because that would be invasive, right? Oh, no, we're definitely going to grow black locusts close to the fruit trees, and we're going to okay. just pop it. But we got, we're going to go to Mary. Mary's been kind of, think, waiting oh. for a little while. <laughs> 
for that question. There's Mary. So I apologize, Mary. You have your hand up. You're waving. You're doing all the things. <laughs> um, earlier, earlier, I was noticing you're unmuted, but, um, my, you know, conversation. Thank you, Mary. Welcome. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up about feeding the deer. Um, here's how I deal with deer. I live, I manage my land as a wildlife refuge anyway, and I grow all my own food here and have a food forest, and I don't have a deer problem. And I think the reason is that um, I've found that deer like particular foods better than anything. And those are two things, they're fireweed and willow herb. They're both epilobiums. Deer will walk through your yard. They're, they tend to walk around um, these uh, rings or trails and they do that pretty regularly. Um, and they'll just take a bite of this and a bite of that and keep going. So along my paths and edges of my gardens and stuff, I let these, uh, fireweed is a perennial, but willow herb is an annual, and I let them come up. I don't weed them out, and the deer will take a bite off it, and then it gets bushier. And um, as the season goes by, I get bushier and bushier um, plants, and then when they do flower, it's really beautiful. Uh, but I don't have much problem with deer eating my vegetables or um, uh, I did fence all my fruit trees until they got up above the browse line. Um, and now when the deer go up for it, that's okay. Um, but anyway, that's how I deal with the deer. I give them, uh, I grow things that I know they like to eat and then they leave my stuff alone. Yeah, and to, to echo that, there's... Uh... One, I want to just give Sylvan's mother the credit for that same thing, that the bottom third is for the deer, the top is for the birds, and the middle's for us in the comments. As that conversation was going on, she had that typed. Um, another great deer, similar to what Mary is saying, is to make a attractive deer, like, like a fence hedge or a fedge or something on the edge, and that can also often stop the deer, like planting a lot of willow. It, the deer here prefer that. And like I've done a trellis with a lot of runner beans on it. There's lots of runner beans on the outside that they can eat and the inside I can harvest. It's similar to what David was talking about, just having enough abundance that we can share with the deer and put something that's very vigorous like runner beans that they can eat that will come back that still has enough for me. It kind of deters them from coming deeper into the garden. And that's been really, really effective. Uh, there's a question of, is willow herb the same as willow? It is not the same. Yeah. It's they're like an annual little... Um, they're epilobiums. Yeah, it's like a little short. It's like a, a foot, two foot high with a red flower, too. Oh, they get about three feet high. Yeah, and they have a very tiny pink flower. Mm -hmm. The other thing yeah, I would say about deer is, um, you know, just to... to to be aware of where they are. If you're just establishing a garden, like really do your site analysis and look through and where's the deer path? You know, oh, this is what they've been doing. Am I gonna put my garden right in the middle of that path? That's their path. Or can I design my gardens or fruit tree layout so that it's, it's in, a, in concert, in alignment with their, um, the way they move through the landscape? I didn't have much of a choice. I have a forest and have been trying to uh, grow a garden for years in a in the clear cut that owns the DNR owns Department of Natural Resources owns next to our community <laughs> with yeah. 900 feet of hose, um, yeah, which has been a challenge. Yeah, in but, trying to grow food in a clear cut, if you take the seed pods of kale and chard and just throw the whole flowers all over the place yeah. in areas that are slightly shaded or in a lull, you might be able to establish kind of a feral kale patch. And if it comes up in the spring like anything else, the deer really notice the new stuff that we plant for them. And if you can sort of trick them to thinking that it's just like any other plant that's growing in their clear cut that they wander through, they might not graze it that heavily. And just throwing yeah, I, I did that. Seed right now is a great way to kind of make a, a yeah. kind of wild patch of kale. And it's really fun to try to colonize um, right. a clear cut with beneficial organisms. Right. I've abandoned the clear cut and I've successfully got uh, wild, a spearmint that's gone wild <laughs> 
lupine that's gone wild and Jerusalem artichokes that I hope survived the heat, but they were still there a little bit in that patch. So now I'm in the clear cut garden where I've cut down the cottonwood tree in the middle of my forest, which is the only place on my actual property. And it turns out, Brian, that the deer, that is not its path, but I don't have a choice where it goes. That's where I'm gonna try. It's the only place that gets sun on my property. <laughs> yeah, so, another comment. So, for, oh, go ahead, Julia. Yeah, so just to finish real quick, Shaley is, so if they're not used to going there, um, you know, is there some, I mean, I've got the peanut butter idea. We've got the fence already, posts already in for electric fence. So if it's not where they've been, um, you know, you might comment <laughs> on that. <laughs> Now that there will be all this wonderful garden stuff there. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to have the space. Um, a, um, we had a question about slugs and I wanted to comment on the fireweed. If you have fireweed or clear cut near you and know the large fireweed, it's a really great tea plant. You can, you can roll the leaves like people do with green tea and the flowers are good for tea also. It's a yummy thing to brew, has a very nice flavor. It's decaf, um, but kind of tastes a little bit like green tea. So fireweed is maybe, one of those maybe nice. Maybe I should plant fireweed around my new garden where there aren't Yeah, it's beer beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, we have a question from Ann Holiday about slugs. Sluggo is something that kills them. They eat it and die, but it's really effective. And slug traps that have like beer in a thing that they can crawl into with a lid, they will also fall in that and die. And that works. I pick them up and threaten them with death and throw them far away from my garden. <laughs> Sometimes it works. <laughs> um, and another thing that works pretty well, but you need to be cautious with is having uh, ducks and geese as a part of your property farm, whatever landscape maintenance plan, because they can go in and they will eat most of the slugs but they'll also eat some of your leafy greens or anything that has aphids on it. So if we incorporated ducks, um, the best time to use them then would be before, like in the spring before there's, when the slugs are getting active and before there's much growth. Is that right? Um, I think, yes. So if you had ducks in an orchard and you could move them to your garden in the spring before you planted things, they would eat the slug eggs. And you could mm -hmm. kind of break the slug cycle. They'll furrow their little beak or bill under the dirt and find all the little juicy grubby. Wow. I thought can. they just take the baby slugs and the big slugs. I didn't know they could find the eggs. That's awesome. Yeah. And then we have a thing in the comments from Kathy. Slugs also, for slugs, use diatomaceous earth as a thin dust. Around yeah, diatomaceous garden. earth is also really good at killing bugs. Is there anybody who wants to have a question or share a comment that hasn't had a chance to speak yet? We can have like yeah. a moment of silence for anyone else. Yeah, I had two questions. Um, if you guys use weed um, burners and if, uh, if like uh, deer hunting is socially acceptable, not that I'm a deer hunter, but I was just wondering. Uh, I love weed burners. I think they're a great way to deal with weeds. You have to be judicious and burn the soil or the rocks. It's especially good for rock areas. You need to leave the fire on there long enough to kind of make the seeds boil in their shells, but <laughs> it can really be effective at uh, killing. A, a, if you have a really bad weedy infestation into an area, it's a nice way to kind of break the cycle and reset the area and you can get away with not weeding it for a long time. You have to be cautious because you could, if it's, if you have woody mulch, you could light it on fire and it uses propane. So you have to be comfortable if you're okay with that. If that's the type of fire you meant. Um, does anyone else have experience with fire and, and you can hunt deer seasonally. You have to get a permit, you know, anyone else use, use fire as a weed control method? No, it's really humbling because I was there realizing that I had this, I felt like a dragon with my flame shooter deciding what plants were allowed to live and which ones needed to die. And it's kind of radical to see how much kind of authority we have in the plant kingdom when we're using a hoe or using a flame torch. But 
you know, it's like the song that Shearston shared this morning. If we do it in service of the bees and the greater, greater environment to make more flowers and keep an ecological harmony, like yeah. we came here and kind of messed up a lot of the ecosystem. So it's good to do our best to use our mind and our heart and our observation skills to restore some healthy balance and more flowers and a good ecology for us all to share. Are there any other people who have been waiting for a moment? Another moment of silence? Anyone? All right. Um, feel free to interrupt if you want to say something, because if there's a lot of just like kind of open conversation time, you might have to or raise your hand. That's a polite thing to do. I have an. Oh, go ahead. Um, like, um, do you guys use um, bad houses for mosquitoes or you don't have problems with like thrips or flying insects or do you is does that is that like something that's talked about bat houses um i know people do have bat houses i have bats and trees there's a lot of trees where i live i don't, haven't felt compelled to make them but i know some people do does anyone else in the forum have experience? Yeah, i haven't i haven't made them myself but they're great bats are great <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the ducks also are great for catching those flying ants and stuff. They go after them like they're candy. <laughs> I'd say bat houses are great, but I would also argue that if we're using bat houses, then maybe we have a degenerative system that's maybe a little bit toxic because a lot of the mosquito larvae will be eaten by amphibians and fish within the water systems. So if we don't have amphibians and fish, that means we have a toxin somewhere coming from somewhere that kill, it's killing the, the the natural predator of the mosquito larva. So anytime you have an infestation of anything like a mosquito, um, yeah, I think we, we probably have a bigger problem, especially if you're in a rural location. And if you're in the city, there's lots of little pockets of mosquitoes can grow, but um, yeah, in the jungle, um, we probably have an imbalance that we need to look at the bigger picture of the environment to fix it. Um, but yeah, bat houses, especially if something used to be a forest, and turned it artificially into a prairie, bat houses are super essential to kind of like regulate the, the change we made in the environment. And that's my perspective on that. And it's really fun to see Meadow. Awesome, see you to see you. <laughs> it's so fun to see new people again. I just, it just reminds me of sometimes when you're walking across a field at the convergence and you know, you're just and not very involved and you know, running from one class to another and then you see someone across the way and so seeing you, Meadow, is like seeing you across the world. Hi, Meadow. Yeah, likewise. I was just smiling seeing that you were here. It made me happy. I have um, no idea what's going on. I'm like just logged in. So I'm. Um, yeah. well, welcome. Oh, and before we watch our movie, is there anybody here who wasn't a part of one of our opening circles that would now like to say their name? where they're from, and three words of intention in showing up this weekend. That was our opening circle connectivity. Yeah, Meadow, please go for it. And then anybody else who missed that and would like to. All right, my name's Meadow. Um, I actually just got a job on a farm a week ago. So that is my intention for this um, uh, convergence is all seeing old friends and then also um, kind of working with the skills for this kind of new job that I've been working. Yeah. And to, yeah, contribute. I don't, and also learning all this Zoom stuff. This is like very first time for me. But I, I also am working like um, in the daytime, so I won't really be here for the day stuff. Well, we're recording everything, so you'll be able to listen to it whenever it's best for you. Heck yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. hey I had something I wanted to add to about bats before we get too far away. Um, I was going to build bat boxes here at Owl Farm. It's been on my list for years to do that. And I finally got ready to, did some research and found that uh, they it would be a, um, a sink for them if they're not within <laughs> quarter mile of water of a body of water for where they can hunt so um i'm right on the outs 
you know, I'm right on the very edge of that. And so um, they probably wouldn't survive if, if they, if I did put a box here, because um, it would be too far for them to go to, to do serious hunting. So that's just something to keep in mind. How far are you from a lake or a river or something? Or oh, if I you have ducks. Ducks attract bugs and make bugs happen a lot. And that's where I see all my bats are flying over my ducks. Just FYI. If you have ducks, you have water. <laughs> As Libby's waiting to share. She's been raising her hand for a bit. Hi, my name's Libby Carr and I live at um, Sangaya. Uh, I had such a great time looking at the videos of Sahali because a couple of years ago I went there on five different retreats in one, like in an eight month period. It was just wonderful. I loved it and, and uh, shout out to everybody at Sahali. Um, I just, um, I've, I moved to Sangaya about four years ago, and it's a wonderful place, and I've been more involved in the um, administrative, you know, helping to run the community, and don't know a lot about permaculture, so it's so fun listening to all of you with your tips on how to grow a great garden and keep the deer away. And, and um, it's really wonderful. So thank you. I'm just eavesdropping on everything, but glad to finally attend a, um, a session here. I've often heard of it from uh, Patricia Newkirk and Anita um, Higgins, who have been deeply involved in our large garden out here at, at Sangaya. Well, you're oh, in good hands with Anita. She's a dear friend and an she, awesome permaculture great. designer. Yeah, she's great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any of the other people who haven't checked in yet? I see like Bruce and Insa and... I haven't checked in. No, you haven't. Please do. I can't, I can't uh, no, wait. Uh, my name is Marcy Bielma. I live in Santa Monica, California. I have a little ranch in Bakersfield that had an old orchard and like lots of flying bugs. Um, I have a general interest in sustainability and um, eventually I'll find a community, you know, an intentional community to, you know, I'll probably cash out and, do, you know, explore. So I'm just, in the meantime, I do as much education as I can to learn everything I can. Well, Awesome, thank you. This is a, a nice forum and, and a plug for continuing conversations in our, we made, these are more fun digital tools that are probably new to a lot of us is the Slack group and the Discord. They are chat, chat places where there's conversations organized by what they're about and you can create them, you can search for them and you can build community or find community around different ideas and you know make more friends even if they're digital or maybe they live close to you and keep those conversations. It's, it's a nice tool to, to take what we're doing here and carry it on. And I see Bruce turned on. Absolutely. And I just oh. think that there's oh. so much consciousness yeah. in yeah. Eugene, Oregon and Northern California. There's just so much more awareness. Well, so thank cool. you. may it spread everywhere. <laughs> may, may, may we gain the awarenesses that we don't have too while we give away the ones that we do. <laughs> uh, when I was Bruce? in California, I thought that the consciousness went up to Oregon, but now that I live in Washington, I know that it's up here too. <laughs> I think there's a lot of it everywhere. It's just not maybe as well publicized in certain places. Um, Bruce Dobson, can you, would you like the microphone? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm, Brent Naylor turned me on to this. Uh, so thank you, Brent. And now I see that uh, Brian, who's, I'm in his extended family, is a, a star, permaculture star. So I have 10 acres. It's mostly alder and two chickens and two raised beds. So I'm, I'm just uh, looking to um, expand, doing less computer work too. Yeah. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> 
Yeah. Glad you're here too. <laughs> are there others who would like to, are, and are, so are you from Bellingham? I, did, I missed where you were from. Uh, I'm from Whidbey Island. Whidbey Island. Whidbey. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, quite near Brian's mother, where nice. she lives. Mm. Cool. Alexa. Uh, Alexa, Alan, you are one of our speakers, I think, tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, that's part of why I wanted to tune in and see what's shaking here as I duck in and out of the busy harvest season here at Hawthorne Farm. I'm made out of Hawthorne Farm, which is about 20 miles outside of Seattle in Woodenville, Washington, on traditional Snoqualmie territory, as far as I know, whose traditions and elders of past, present, and future I respect. And we are um, a food a food farm. We grow food for the entire household, specializing in a year-round full diet. And we have a great time experimenting with that. And it's absolutely delicious. And I'm thrilled to be here. I'll be ducking in and out through the weekend as I can and definitely showing up tomorrow evening to talk about our draft ponies and how we use horsepower on the farm over the past few years. So much fun and it's delightful to be here um, in any way I can. So thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Are there others who would like to share? Um, I see Blythe, she lives here in Squim. I don't know if you want to share your intention or anything about the wonderful things you do. Um, any others? All right. Well, that's the perfect time then if we've all said our hellos and our mealtime chats to stream our movie for the night. And David, if you didn't see where it was, I pinned it to the top of our planning channel, the link there. And we have an exclusive